The public may see Don King as a benign rogue, but his roots go back to a violent past in blue-collar Cleveland, Ohio, where intimidation was a way of life. Excellent. And we're coming right up to the spot where... Yes, here, maybe. No. 30 feet ahead, somewhere in there, right about in that area. I returned to King's old neighborhood with Bob Tunney, a former Cleveland police officer. Tunney was an eyewitness when King, a numbers racketeer, stomped a man to death in 1966. We were driving west on Cedar, and I saw a few hundred feet ahead, man lying on the sidewalk, man standing over him, kicking him in the head. We drove up there immediately, stopped the car, and I jumped out of the vehicle, and the man standing up had a revolver in his hand. So I pulled out my gun, I says, drop the gun. He took the gun, threw it on the back trunk of another vehicle that was parked there. I went over immediately and grabbed that gun, and as I did, this gentleman standing up just went over to the man lying down and gave him one vicious kick again right in the head. Police officers rushed to aid the victim. One of them took this photograph. Detective Tunney is shown leaning over the man, Sam Garrett. Garrett weighed 100 pounds less than King, and he owed King $600. And he kept saying to me, Donald, I'll pay you, I'll pay you, I'll pay you. He repeated it a couple times, and after that, he just lapsed in unconsciousness. Donald King was well known to the Cleveland Police Department. His rap sheet shows that he was arrested more than 30 times between 1951 and 1966 on charges ranging from gambling to assault. In 1954, King killed a man in a shootout. It was a case of self-defense. A high school graduate with a quick mind for mathematics, King had been working in the illegal numbers business since age 18. In the early 1960s, he was the biggest numbers boss in Cleveland and was grossing $15,000 a day. A previously undisclosed FBI document reports that King was kicking back a portion of his profits to the Cleveland Mafia in return for protection of his numbers operation. I also learned new information about the Sam Garrett murder case. Detective Tawney told me he was offered what he believes was a bribe. Uh, probably the fall of 66, I got approached by an attorney. And he says, you know, Tony, Donald can do a lot for you. And I knew what he meant right away, and I said, well, forget it. Police reports allege that King spent $30,000 to buy off witnesses to the killing. It seemed to work. None showed up to testify at the trial. But based on the eyewitness account of Detective Tony, a jury convicted Don King of second-degree murder after just four hours of deliberation. Then in a highly unusual move, the judge met with King and his lawyer and reduced the jury's murder verdict down to manslaughter. Nobody from the prosecutor's office was present at the meeting. Carl DeLau was Tunney's boss in the homicide unit. He suspects the case was fixed. But definitely, why would that reduction of penalty from second degree murder to manslaughter take place on a Saturday morning without the proper authorities being notified? Something was very radically wrong, and it was a miscarriage of justice, there's no question about it. I, had, I got in a fist fight in what I would call uh, frustrations of the ghetto expressing themselves. When you're dealing with King served four area, years and got out of prison in 1971. Sub, uh, he later gave his version of the homicide to a British reporter. How did you kill a man in a fist fight? Well, we was fighting one another and we was kicking one another and his head hit the concrete and it, was, it must have been a pretty bad blow, which I've suffered deep contrition for since it happened. But nevertheless, I was instrumental in the fatality of a fellow human being whom happened to be a, one of my personal friends. As to allegations that he tampered with justice, King denies the charges. And in 1983, King was able to obtain a full pardon from the governor of Ohio for the Sam Garrett killing. In 1974, just three years out of prison, Don King created his masterpiece. Preaching black solidarity, King convinced Muhammad Ali, George Foreman, and the black government of Zaire to join in what would become known as the Rumble in the Jungle. In a brilliant stroke of salesmanship, King convinced the government of Zaire to put up $10 million to finance the fight, even though the country was mired in poverty. 
Of the three men who started King out in boxing, two were still with him, Muhammad Ali and Lloyd Price, who was now a partner with King in the music deal. The event made Don King, but even in his triumph, King betrayed another one of the men who had helped get him his start and who had been his loyal friend. He cheated Price out of his share of the partnership. I know that I should have a piece of the business because Don told me I should have a piece of the business. In fact, we should be 50-50 partners. To this day, and that was in 1974, I haven't got paid, even though I was locked into a letter of credit. Six years later, King would betray the last of the men who helped give him his start. After Muhammad Ali had suffered a brutal beating in his last championship fight, King shortchanged him out of a million dollars. Ali sued to get his fair share of the purse. But King found the one man who could get Ali to drop the suit, Ali's longtime friend and Muslim brother, Jeremiah Shabazz. King asked Shabazz to deliver payoff money to Ali and have him sign a release. I was in Don's office. Don gave me the money with specific instructions. Don't give this money to Ali unless he signs that paper. And it was 50000 on his desk? Uh, yeah, it was 50000 50, cash dollars, yes. Ali, his health deteriorating and facing years of expensive litigation, accepted the cash and signed the release. I'll never do it when I presented the documents back to Don. He was just so pleased. He said, you know, I had done a real great job. He thanked me, and, you know, I was his boy at that time. Um, Don and I would still be friends, except that um, this guy, he just uses people. When he uses you up, then he has no more need for you. He, he, he goes on to the next one. You're just so much cannon fodder, just, just a nothing. Right after my press credentials were yanked, I watched Mike Tyson being led away by a sea of bodyguards. Mike Tyson's relationship with Don King has all the makings of an American tragedy. Tyson and I both grew up in the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn. I met him when he was 14 years old through my friend, former light heavyweight champion, Jose Torres. I don't know, he's like when he was in jail, you know. He, he is now like in jail with all this bunch of people, you know, surrounding him and overprotecting him on behalf of Don King. Mike Tyson was sent to the Tryon Youth Correctional Facility in upstate New York after growing up as a mugger and predator on the streets of Brooklyn. He was 13 years old. Bobby Stewart, a counselor at the Reformatory and former professional boxer, first saw Tyson in 1979. He had acted out in some way and he was being escorted through the field by two of the bigger staff on campus. And uh, reports were that he was be very careful of him, very violent. Tyson told Stewart that he wanted to learn how to box. After teaching him the basics, Stewart then brought Tyson to a gym above the police station in Catskill, New York, to meet Customato. That's it, see, ain't no way he's gonna hit you then, right? And remember, it's always good to throw the punch where you could hit him and he can't hit you. That's what the science of boxing is all about. Remember from the side... D'Amato had developed many boxers, including world champions Floyd Patterson and Jose Torres. He spotted Tyson's potential immediately. He said, barring outside distractions, if that kid is able to, you know, uh, concentrate his efforts on becoming a fighter, and if he wants it, more importantly, he said it's a heavyweight champion of the world. The joy of finding one last great fighter may have prolonged D'Amato's life. And D'Amato saved Tyson from returning to a life of crime. He legally adopted him. Then in 1985, Cus D'Amato died. Jim Jacobs, one of Tyson's co-managers, took D'Amato's place as Tyson's surrogate father. One year later, 
Tyson fulfilled D'Amato's prediction. That was a right to the body and an uppercut He's... to the head, and Burbick is down. In a devastating second round knockout, Mike Tyson, age 20, became the youngest heavyweight champion in boxing history. It's over, that's all, and we have a new era in boxing. His managers, cornermen, and friends ran to congratulate him. Tyson kissed Jim Jacobs. But in March of 1988, Jacobs died, and Tyson lost his second father substitute. Before Jacobs was buried, Don King made his move, using black solidarity to seduce Tyson. I mean, the perception of the public, blacks in particular, I spoke to them, they think they are proud that Don King is doing what used to be controlled by the white man, the promotional business, and that he's there because he's tough. You know, he doesn't take shit from anybody. He's According tough. to Torres, who was King's confidant at the time, King also used anti-Semitism to get Tyson to abandon his friends. He said to me, you know, you have to understand, Jose, that Bill Caton, Shelley Finkel, the Jacobs, the Finkers, the Catons, Jews, they just, they want to control the situation. You don't understand this. I know, I deal with these people. Catskill to move in with he even got Tyson to abandon his surviving manager, Bill uh, Caton. King actually came here and said to me, sure I've poisoned Mike's mind against you. You give me my four year exclusive emotional agreement and I'll unpoison him. <laughs> By the fall of 88, Tyson's life was in chaos. He was estranged from Bill Caton, and King was still trying to muscle in. When he knocked out Larry Holmes, he had uh, Robin Givens in one section, Naomi Campbell in the second section, and Suzette Charles in the third section, and they were all very classy women. He fell in love with Robin Givens. Let's get the lead out. Yes, dear. Mike Tyson, the world heavyweight champion, had fallen in love. She was an ambitious young actress whose mother always seemed to be in the picture. He was the champ, worth millions, with a potential for hundreds of millions, but considered immature. The match seemed improbable, but the relationship blossomed suddenly. He's wow, this is great. Unbelievable. I'm with Robin Gibbons, the, the, the star head of the, head of the class. Uh, she had gone to Sarah Lawrence. I think she was uh, higher class than he ever thought he would obtain. And I think one of Mike's weaknesses was that he always had very low self-esteem. He, we fight Larry Holmes. I, I'm not exactly sure how it went. Before the fight or right after the fight, Robin Gibbons tells Mike Tyson that she's pregnant with his baby. Ruth Roper gets on the phone to Jimmy Jacobs and Bill Caton and says, your fighter has made my daughter pregnant. I want him to marry her. Mike Tyson and Robin Givens were married on February 7th, 1988. Givens would announce she'd had a miscarriage shortly thereafter. Despite that, there were hopes in the Tyson camp that the marriage to the actress would work out. Of course, the idea of Mike being married was something that appealed to me. I felt it would give him uh, a certain stability, he, uh, he was a, uh, a womanizer, there's no other way to describe him. He loved women, and women loved him. And uh, I felt that this was a good step. I was all in favor of his marriage. The tabloid headlines were still to come. The published reports of fights in the Bernardsville, New Jersey mansion Gibbons and Tyson had bought. Tyson, though, was already telling his friends that the marriage wasn't working. And those who spent time with Tyson daily saw a dangerous trend with Robin Givens and her mother taking over. He beats uh, Tubbs, 
on the plane ride back, uh, Robin Givens and Ruth Roper announced, Robin Givens announced, I'm Mrs. Tyson. Everything goes through me. And they start spending his money. Before they got married, she was terrific. She was kind, she was warm, she was considerate. But once they got married, she announced, I'm Mrs. Mike Tyson, and I'm taking over. And when I heard that, I knew we were in trouble. I knew Mike was in trouble. I said, this is going to be bad. This is bad. This is, this is bad. And from then on, she tried to pull him away. And in Tokyo, in 88, after one month of marriage, he came in the room one day and started crying. And he put his head on my shoulder. I said, what's the matter? And he said, I, I made a mistake. I said, why? He said, I shouldn't have gotten married. This is bad. I shouldn't have gotten married. I said, Mike, everything's going to be OK. It's going to be OK. I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. Just how wrong was becoming clear. Tyson and Givens were driving one of his Bentleys when they started arguing. Tyson became so angry that he jumped out of the vehicle and told surprised police officers they could keep it, though the next day he sent an aide to get it back. In training, Tyson looked great as he prepared for another title defense. But outside of the gym, things were getting badly out of control. Robin Givens' mother, Ruth Roper, was painted in newspaper stories as the architect of a scheme to grab Tyson's millions. Givens rushed to her mother's defense on live television. I plan to be here today because I'm angry, because my mother, who has been the, the best mother and clearly become Michael's mother, and there, if you can just see their relationship, um, it's a beautiful relationship, is, is really being crushed by all this. Sensational charges flew. Allegations that Givens and her mother were trying to eliminate the people who brought Tyson to greatness. Givens portrayed herself as a loyal wife, trying to protect her husband against boxing sharks, who she claimed were stealing Tyson's money. With a vicious behind-the-scenes battle for control, only in the ring did Tyson seem safe. But that, too, would change. His fight with Spinks, he may have been one of the two best heavyweights of all time. The moves he made in that fight were extraordinary to knock out Spinks, who was a very capable fighter in 91 seconds. But, as, but then he fired Kevin. He broke off from me. Ruth Roper hits uh, Bill Kane with, 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 a, with a lawsuit the day of the fight that I know in my heart Mike Tyson knew nothing about. 1988 became a blur of embarrassments and disasters for the champ. Just two months after the triumph of the Spinks fight, and the break from his longtime manager and trainer, Tyson was arrested after breaking his hand in a street brawl with Mitch Green, a boxer he'd beaten two years earlier in the ring. The argument had begun inside a boutique in Harlem. Green, verbally, hit directly at Tyson's weak spot. He's a young, dumb, knucklehead that got to ask his wife for permission to do whatever he do. You understand what I'm trying to say? Mitch Green wasn't the only one saying it. And it seemed Tyson would have to choose between his old friends and his new wife. Robin Gibbons was saying his manager, Bill Caton, had cheated him, that he needed to change the people handling his career. What wasn't widely known was that she and her mother had been getting advice from Don King, the colorful and controversial boxing promoter. King is painted by Tyson's early friends as one of the principal villains in the story. And it was almost as if Robin Gibbons was the jab that set him up for the right hand of Don King. I'm a controversial figure because I succeed in spite of, not because of. Uh, many people in, that have been beleaguered with the problems that I've been uh, assaulted and assailed with I would have been gone a long time ago. They wouldn't even be here. Don King had become Tyson's new father figure. If Tyson had spent his life in search of someone to replace the dad he'd never had, friends say, starting from when he was very young, Often his choices didn't work out. Oh, when you're out in the street looking for um, guidance, you know, who do you get it from? I know it's easy to get attached to people. Sometimes you realize later in life that your friends were really your worst enemies. Mike Tyson was the world heavyweight champion. And on the streets of Brownsville, where he'd spent his early years, there were murals in his honor. But in a throwback to his days on these mean streets, Tyson had broken his hand in a street brawl. Behind the scenes, Tyson's personal life had become increasingly bizarre. The arguments between Tyson and his wife, Robin Givens, continued and escalated, with rumors being printed in newspapers about the most intimate details, some of them completely false. They 
inserted into Mike's head that Robin was having an affair with Donald Trump. This was the beginning of the end because this did two things for Don King. It put Mike's perfect marriage on the rocks and it also cracked the relationship that Donald Trump had with Tyson. Trump, the prominent New York developer, had tried to straighten out Tyson's increasing financial and management problems and secure Tyson's fights as an attraction for his Atlantic City hotels. For a while, Trump added stability to Tyson's professional life, but his personal life was increasingly troubled. September 4, 1988, Tyson was raced to a hospital after he smashed his wife's BMW into a tree. Robin Givens rode in the ambulance and almost battled with photographers trying to take Tyson's picture. But a newspaper claimed Tyson had attempted suicide after another argument with Givens. So if anybody wants to kill himself, would he hit the site, the site of the car? He would go straight for the, for the tree. He went on the side of the car. It's scary because I was standing right over here. I knew it wasn't Mike trying to commit suicide. What I did know is Mike can't drive at all. Mike just can't drive, so I just brushed that off. That was so silly. Why didn't he try it again with another BMW? He had 25 cars. So it was so silly, it was ridiculous. Michael is intimidating, to say the least. I think that there's, there's a time when he cannot control his temper. His temper wasn't the only thing getting out of control. Tyson and Robin Givens appeared on the ABC program 2020, and Tyson sat there docilely as his wife ripped him apart on national television. But the most damaging line about the world champion was yet to come. Michael is a manic depressive. He is. I mean, that's just a fact. And just recently, I've become afraid. I mean, very, very much afraid. I like to raise hell, I mean, because that's basically my nature. I mean, come from my background and thing, but I mean, I'm not a violent guy. I, don't, I would never want to hurt anyone. One of them was going to hurt each other, and she decided to do it then to expose what they were going to because Robin never realized that Mike's buttons were being pushed. When we walked into that house, he was a 200-pound gorilla. Robin does the 2020 and paints this brutal picture of Mike Tyson. He looked like he was dazed, like he just wasn't there. It was a few days later that, you know, he, he blew his stack. At no time did the police observe Mr. Tyson strike or threaten anyone. Blowing his stack this time met a huge argument with Givens in which Tyson reportedly hurled furniture out of the window of the Bernardsville mansion the couple shared. Soon the police arrived. They just as quickly left. But Tyson's marriage was in shambles, as was his image. They convinced Mike that he was manic depressive, which he wasn't. In fact, Mike actually stated to the press that he was manic depressive. They put him, when I say they, they hired or retained the services of a psychiatrist who uh, put him on lithium, a very dangerous mind-altering drug, so that, uh, and kept reminding Mike to take the drug, which he should never have taken in the first place. It was time for major damage control, and Tyson's longtime friend stepped in, hiring their own psychiatrist. When I saw him, he showed no sign whatsoever of psychotic thinking or behavior, and none of the criteria that are required to establish a diagnosis of manic depressive illness. Gibbons was on the way out. But despite the favorable diagnosis, Tyson's temper was so frayed that one morning when he spotted the cameraman taping his training run, he hurled his Walkman at the lens. Tyson wouldn't admit it, but his breakup with Givens was not something he wanted. His friends say he really was in love with his wife. I made a huge mistake. I forgot what it was like for a young guy to think he was in love, to be in love, to think you're in love, and lose the woman of your dreams, to lose this woman for whatever reason. Mike was distraught. He was really sad. He didn't show it, he's a professional, but I should have realized he was that sad, that emotionally distraught. And I should have stayed with him. I should have been with him. I should have taken him on a trip somewhere to make him forget his troubles, and he would have been fine. That was my mistake. But things got worse when he separated from Robin Givens, whom he had married seven months earlier. Steve Lott was Tyson's assistant trainer and close friend. Robin had a tremendous influence negatively on Mike's character and emotion. And after she 
left later in, in the year, Don found it very easy to jump in because that character that was so powerful before in Mike was in crumbles, was in shambles. And Mike, and Mike was no match for Don at that time emotionally to battle his wit and his con. King soon had complete control over Tyson's personal life and boxing career. Both have declined ever since. Situation at the time, but rolling willingly just to try to get in the shot that will finish things in. Oh, the uppercut! What an uppercut by Douglas! And down goes Tyson. In 1990, in a stunning upset, Tyson lost his title to Buster Douglas, a complete unknown. It's over! It's over! Mike Tyson has been knocked out! Unbelievable! And Tyson was indicted for rape two months ago. Back up! Back up! Back up! Everything his adopted father, Customato, had tried to prevent had come true under the tutelage of Don King. If he went somewhere where the business was better and he became a greater fighter and more of a hero and respected and revered by everyone in sports and everyone in the planet, I'd say, Mike, I'd shake your hand because you did it. You, you did a great job. But that's not what happened. I'm jealous that they have my friend and they've destroyed the greatest fighter I've ever seen. I, I don't know what to say. I, I... I want the best for Mike. You know, if that's, a, I tend to believe history, if you look at the fighters Don King's been involved with, I, I see mostly suits that are all suing him, it seems. I hope in Mike's case it's different, that uh, things are changed. But if you go on uh, past history, you know, he's gonna be the loser in the long run. Because everything was chaos. I was fighting with a wife, with managers, you know, I mean, promoters and managers fighting. I was torn between everybody because I wanted to be loyal to everyone. I never had a chance to be loyal to myself. I think he became more and more of a lost soul. Uh, trained less and less, hung out more and more with these pimps and drug dealers and rap musicians. Uh, and there was no one in his life to reinforce the positive values and no one in his life who loved him enough to say, no, you can't do that. By all accounts, Mike Tyson was headed for a fall. He was still fighting, and for the moment, holding on. But those who taught him and saw him rise were seeing their hard work evaporate. February 25th, 1989, Mike Tyson beat underdog Frank Bruno. But Bruno started strong. Tyson, for the first time, seemed less than invincible in the ring. He'd no longer slip punches. He came right in straight. He didn't bob and weave. He didn't punch in combination. He was no longer the same fighter he was when he was being taught by Kevin Rooney. He rocks Tyson in the first round, rocked him. He, can't, he doesn't finish him, he should have, he doesn't. Mike knocks him out in the fifth round. I, I, I saw a hundred mistakes, a hundred. Tyson wasn't really challenged when he knocked out Carl Williams five months later in a first round walkover. His next scheduled bout was with Buster Douglas, a title defense with someone who should have been an easy opponent but Tyson seemed to have lost his intensity, the animal power that had propelled him to the top. He was overconfident, out of shape. Buster Douglas was in shape and proved it, blasting Tyson hard. Douglas landed that punch, but he was, he was beating Mike the whole fight. And if you look at that fight from the introductions on, Mike was not himself. His mind seemed a million miles away. He lacked that animal intensity. It was like an imposter had invaded his body. Mike never trained for that fight. Mike was in no condition for that fight. Mike's techniques eroded, and when he's, the other guy starts throwing punches, Mike starts getting hit because he doesn't practice the techniques anymore. And when you add the combination together, and a very finely tuned Buster Douglas, confident, trained, at the right spot at the right time, very relaxed, trying, doing his best, it was the wrong combination for Tokyo and Mike got knocked out in 10 rounds. He's, he, it's over! It's over! Mike Tyson has been knocked out! And when I was champion, I gave everybody a chance and I didn't like anyone making any kind of excuses when I beat them, so by all means, I'm not gonna make any excuses. I lost, the reason I lost, you know what I mean, not irrelevant, just a loss is a loss. You take the bitter with the sweet, so 
We on crack. And I still believe I'm the best fight in the world. Just give me another chance. The titles are meant to be won and they're meant to be lost. These things happen. But you know, like I said, I'm the, cha- I'm the, um, the former champion. Just give me a rematch. Tyson wanted to fight Douglas again, but Don King didn't seem to be pushing hard for the rematch. As the controversy swirled, there were even louder questions about the pairing of the ex-champ and the promoter. Allegations that King's side called sour grapes. Complaints that King should not try to be both Tyson's manager and promote his fights. A manager tries to get as much money for his fighter as possible. A promoter tries to pay the fighter as little as he can because he keeps the difference between the income and what he pays the fighter. So there's a basic conflict of interest between a promoter and a fighter. Though he'd started his boxing comeback with a series of four impressive victories, Tyson went out of the gym, was alone and isolated. Then Don King asked him to come to the Miss Black America pageant in Indianapolis, saying it would help his tarnished image. Tyson's bodyguard and chauffeur says Tyson was in no mood to go, having spent the day at a memorial service for a friend. Don insisted that he do this Indianapolis thing. He needed to do this because he needed to go there and represent all the black people of America and, and it's your duty, you're a black man and, and he hides behind that black rage of black and black and black and finally he gets to this guy to a point where he says, all right, right, I'll go. Just leave me alone. Get us two tickets and we'll be there. I was on that USF flight with Mike Tyson that morning prior to boarding when Dale Everett, Mike Tyson's, uh, Don King's nephew, police officer, shows up that Don King has a new set of orders, that they're escorting Don, Mike Tyson to Indianapolis, and I'm to drive one of the Ferraris back to Ohio and wait for Mike to come home. Hello, my name is Desiree. Mike Tyson would later say his evening with Desiree Washington hadn't seemed that out of the ordinary to him. But the teenage Miss Black America contestant story, told to a 911 operator, was of a date she'd remember for all the wrong reasons. The report coming into Indianapolis Police Headquarters July 19, 1991, was the kind of sad story police hear all the time. But this time, the accused rapist was Mike Tyson, a world-renowned heavyweight boxer. Mike Tyson had met Washington when he was brought to the Miss Black America pageant by promoter Don King. The visit was a publicity stunt in the middle of Tyson's preparation for his first big money fight after losing the World Heavyweight Championship. Tyson had asked Washington out on a date. She'd accompanied him back to room 606 in the Canterbury Hotel, his room, well after midnight. Tyson's account of what happened, recorded on audio tape when he testified before a grand jury, was that the only thing he'd done wrong was not treating Washington nicely after they had sex. He hadn't walked her to the door. I said, I want you. She said, I want to be me and you alone. Yeah. I want you. Yeah. Yeah, What did she say? She said, okay, just call me. Did you say anything else? No, I had to leave. He's grabbed every woman in town. Mike Tyson was used to fans and victories. But when he came to the Marion County Courthouse, he was headed for the worst defeat of his life. Tyson would see what was left of his glory stripped from him, as a jury of eight men and four women convicted the former world heavyweight boxing champion of rape. Sentenced to six years in prison, Tyson was led away in handcuffs. He's been convicted beyond a reasonable doubt. He's a convicted felon. He's a rapist. He's go to penitentiary like everybody else does. Every minute that Mr. Tyson is in confinement, is a minute of injustice. It had been more than half his lifetime since young Mike Tyson had spent his time behind bars. And Tyson's attorneys battled, unsuccessfully, to keep him out of jail pending an appeal. But the conviction on rape charges proved more than a legal knockdown. And it sounded as if it might be the final bell. 
Mike Tyson seemed to have destroyed himself as spectacularly as he'd burst upon the scene. Tyson was never meant to be a great champion. He didn't have the character. He was meant to be a shooting star. He was meant to be a, a, a sensational shooting star. But halfway through his sentence, in an interview, Tyson said that when he emerged from prison, he'd fight again. And he declared he isn't upset with a woman who'd accused him of date rape. I'm not angry at it. I just, I just despise the actions. Welcome to Larry King Live. Tonight on our King Size Week, Mike Tyson. So there's no bitterness? Or is there? I'm not bitterness, but you know, I'm, this is one time I would like to have a little revenge. You know what I mean? I, I, just, I always go from this perspective. Um, whatever happens, you know what I mean? And sometimes you hit me with your best shot and we see how I handle it. But when the same thing happens to you, we must always remember never to take it personal. I never take this personal. Tyson's friends say it was the completion of a tragic circle. Tyson was totally alone. The key figures in his life were gone, just when Iron Mike needed them most. If any lesson that Mike Tyson has taught me, as my experience, is that money cannot buy you happiness. It can only buy you time until you realize that you're not happy. And that's, that's, that's the question here. He wasn't happy when those boxing lights went out and those rings and everybody got a cut of their millions and I was still sitting with the same guy who I met six years ago who had no friends, no interests. But my, my situations of my life have to be conducted totally different than it was before. The Mike Tyson that was out there before conducting business was just a child. I won the title, I was just 20, just turned 20, I won the title, I was just a child. And I left, I, I had no chance to cultivate myself because if I did cultivate, I didn't cultivate in a proper direction because everything was chaos. In prison, Mike Tyson says he is a changed man. He has converted to a new religion, Islam. But he's fallen back to an old belief about those around him. I believe everyone that's involved in my life, one day or other, would betray me. I believe that. I just, I'm totally believed that. Artist Leroy Neiman is one of those who visited Tyson in jail. He's smaller and lighter, but he, he's clean as I... His complexion is clean, you know, and his eyes are just completely pure and clean. He listens, he's sharp, he's relaxed, he's, he's counting the days, I guess. The greatest country in the world, man. This is America, baby. Okay. Don King was facing his own legal troubles, having just been indicted for insurance fraud when he was asked about Tyson's future. <laughs> you think he can come out and fight and win? Yes. Yes, yes. I've been robbed and abused and taken advantage of all my life and lied to. I'm not going back into that same predicament again. You know what I mean? Eventually, I'm going to have a family and I'm going to have children and I have to set an example for that. So I'm a specialist in it. I'm just a specialist. There's no doubt about it. And, and Allah forgive me for being vain, but I'm just expressing the fact I'm the best in what I do. I'm just the total best. There's guys out there that are great. They're great fighters, but they could do anything else. Ladies and gentlemen, this is all I want to do. The youngest and new WBC heavyweight champion of the world, Michael Tyson. If Mike Tyson fights again under Don King, it will add millions to King's empire. An empire which already includes a $5 million mansion in Ohio, condos in Los Angeles and Las Vegas, and two townhouses in New York. In 1988, he bragged that his company grossed more than $100 million a year. All this from being the most successful entrepreneur in boxing history, promoting over 200 championship fights.